What's up guys and welcome back to Monink. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? And if you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you're just here because you want to see a little adventure into the ancient underworld. Well then this is not only the video for you but this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be discussing the Aeneid book 6. If I could summarize Virgil's Aeneid book 6 into one sentence it would just be that Aeneas goes to the underworld and he's sees the race of future Romans. That is obviously the most important part because it is incredibly political. It is Virgil's incredible storytelling moment where he has Aeneas literally see the people that Rome is going to produce, for lack of a better phrase, right? So that is, this is important, okay? This is one of the most important mythological moments, I think in all of Roman mythology, is when Aeneas goes into the underworld. It's just fantastic. And as a student, if you guys are watching this as a student, if not, then you can disregard this next thing. But this is going to be the main book that you guys focus on. I think it's gonna be Dido in this one, because this one is all about the future comings of Rome. This is before Rome is even a thing, before Rome is even birthed. Aeneas is not even on the site that Rome will be, and yet he's seeing all of the future Romans and the greatness that is to come as soon as he acknowledges that this is what his destiny is and that he has to keep pushing forward in order to achieve this. So with that being said, let's make this make a little bit more sense and get into the narrative. So the book opens, and if you guys remember from the last book, if you guys remember from book five, that we had uh, the guy who was steering the ships, Palinurus, he fell into the sea, right? So he's, he's gone. And Aeneas now takes over the boat. So he's taken over, and because Neptune had previously promised Aeneas's mother Venus that he was going to keep them safe with the little double act of Neptune and Aeneas the boats now get safely uh, docked can you say that like safely they pull in to the land uh, in Italy which is Cumae all the men now get off the boat they all start settling they start looking to make camp there and to get comfortable there and Aeneas now he walks up to where the citadel of Apollo is in these lands now this is very important because Virgil tells us that actually are you guys familiar with the Minotaur I'm not really sure if you guys are but either way I don't know who's watching this if you're not familiar with the Minotaur there's a very important important character from that ancient Greek myth, who's this guy called Daedalus. Now he was the guy who constructed the labyrinth. He's a very, very famous uh, mythological architect. And he created this crazy labyrinth for the Minotaur to live in. Now the very famous part of his myth is that he constructs these wings for him and his son Icarus. Icarus, as we know, flies too close to the sun when they try and escape uh, Crete, which is where they are. So when they try and escape Crete, Icarus flies too close to the sun, his wings melt, he then falls into the sea and he dies. But the important part of this myth is that apparently Daedalus kept flying then, because obviously he's over all of this sea. He keeps flying and he lands in Cumae. And this is important because when Aeneas goes to the citadel of Apollo, when he goes to his temple and he goes to acknowledge all of like the beauty of this temple, all of the imagery is centered around that episode. So this temple is absolutely beautiful. Like even the descriptions, you're like, holy shit, they put this on a temple? Even literature wise, that's impressive that he did that. And Aeneas is standing in front of it and he's marveling at just the absolute artistic beauty of this temple. But Achates, his friend, had actually run ahead of him to go and see if there was anybody at the temple that they could speak to because Aeneas really wants to speak to Apollo because his father Anchises had told him to do so in the previous book in a dream. If we remember that, if not, it's fine. I just explained the most important part of the last book to you. So Achates now appears as Aeneas is marveling at this temple. He appears with a priestess, right? So she comes around and she sees Aeneas, you know, staring up at this temple and she's kind of like, yoo-hoo, now's not the time to be marveling at the temple. If you would like to speak to the god, here's what you have to do. Sacrifice seven bulls and seven sheep and then come and find me. So Aeneas is like, cool, no problem. He makes a little sacrifice and then the priestess is actually in a cave which is just next to the temple. And that is where she gets infused by the god Apollo and where she can really like channel him and everything. And she's called the Sibyl, by the way. That is her official uh, religious name. So he, after making all the sacrifices, Aeneas goes into this cave with the Sibyl. And the Sibyl is like, great, now that you have done all these sacrifices, now you can ask me whatever question it is that you want for the god and I will pass it on and we will speak through me, uh, you and Apollo. Aeneas Aeneas takes a moment to think about his question and he starts off by flattering Apollo by saying, look, you are the god who has guided us through everything. From the first days of the invasion of Troy, you have been there to guide us. You have been there to help us. And he lists off actually a lot of uh, different instances where Apollo had been there, which is most prominently right at the end of the Trojan War. He is the reason why Paris could shoot Achilles and could kill him because Apollo guided the arrow. So Aeneas does, you know, draw attention to all of these things to, you know, sort of show Apollo, like I am paying attention. I'm not just trying to flatter you. I'm doing that. But at the same time, I know my stuff, done my research. He says that if Apollo will answer his question and will help him out this time, will continue to help the Trojans uh, found this new land 
lands and everything like that, that when they get to the new land, they will erect great temples to him, they will honor him, make him like, you know, the, the prime deity that they're going to pray to. However, his question is, what is the next step, right? He's really lost, he's really confused with what to do, and he doesn't really know where to go from here, and if he's on the right track, and what the next step is, before finally getting to Latium. So the Sybil hears this and she gets all infused with the god, right? She's just like, Aeneas, I have heard you and the god is now speaking to me. So Apollo speaks through the Sybil and Apollo tells Aeneas, At long last you were done with the perils of the ocean, but now the perils on land begin. You will go to Latium, but there will be a great war that will come of you. There is a second Achilles there and he wants to fight you. He is born of the land, he is a Latin, and he will fight you for the hand of Lavinia, but you will win and you will marry her and you will start this long line of the Romans coming from there to Alba Longa to then founding the city. It will happen, and even though it will be hard, because it will be hard. And I know that a lot of other deities have told you this. However, know that your destiny is safe. Strange to hear, but it is safe in amongst the parameters of it being virtually impossible. Aeneas basically, he's got a very long monologue, but he basically says thanks. He's like, cheers for letting me know that. And then he wants to ask one more thing because when he had been visited by Anchises in the previous book, Anchises had told him to come and visit him in the underworld. So now is his chance to ask the Sybil if that is viable. And he says, you know, I really want to go and see my dad. I really want to go into the underworld and I would like to speak to Anchises. I know that people have done this before me. So it's not like I'm asking for that much. Like heroes have gone down heroes of the same line as me, which I think is really important that he says, heroes of the same line as me, heroes like Orpheus have gone down to go and sing, you know, with his lyre and go and see his wife. And I would like to do the same thing with my dad. I would like to go and visit him. I would like to see him and make sure that he's safe and have one last conversation with him because I know that there's something he has to tell me about the future. Again, Apollo hears him and Apollo speaks to him through the Sybil. And so the Sybil says to Aeneas, actually, you are totally right that other heroes have gone down there. And so therefore, yes, you will be able to go to the underworld World. But you have to do two things before you go. Number one would be that you have to go and find this golden branch. Like there's this golden branch on a tree and that is essentially the key to the underworld. So you need to go and get that. It's gonna be in the middle of the forest. It's just gonna be over there. It's fine, you can totally find it. Go over there, find this golden branch and go and pick it from the tree, like break it off from the tree. However, when you go and you find this branch, it should not resist you and it will come to those who deserve it. So if you're supposed to go to the underworld, it will come to you with ease. You won't have to do anything in regards to pulling it or whatever. As soon as you touch it, it will come free from the tree. So go pick that up, bring it back here. And number two, the second thing that you have to do is actually, since you've been here, one of your men has died on the beach. So you should probably go and bury him. And after you've buried him, done the correct funeral rites, then we can go to the underworld. Now Aeneas and Achates, because Achates is still there. Aeneas and Achates, they leave and they're just like, who the f has died? Like we've only been gone for as far as I'm aware. Not that long, maybe an hour, possibly. So as they're walking down to the beach, they're thinking about all of this stuff and they get down to the beach and we hear from Virgil, the person who has died is this guy called Mycenaeus. We get the story of how he died, which is actually quite funny. He's sitting on the beach and he decided to pick up like a seashell, a conch shell, whatever it is. He decided to blow in it. He thinks he's a musical genius for doing this. Unfortunately, as we know, gods don't like this. And so he actually calls out and he challenges the gods on top of that. He challenges the gods and he's like, if anybody can blow a nicer song than me into one of these shells, I suggest you come out and fight me. Which Triton, who's the king of the sea, Triton hears this and Triton's like, that guy. And so he just drowns him, like just straight up drowns him in the sea. He's like, shut the f up. So when Aeneas and Achates get back down to the beach, that is the man who they have to bury. And so he instructs everybody that they have to start, you know, getting everything ready. They've got to like erect some tomb to him and all of this, uh, make do with what they have during the situation. So everybody goes out to search for things. And when Aeneas goes out to start gathering some wood, he actually comes across two doves. Now doves are a symbol of Venus, a symbol of his mother. So he knows that they're going to be there to guide him to do something. And so he thinks that they are going to lead him to uh, the golden branch. So he takes this opportunity to look at the doves and he asks them, please, can you guide me to this golden thing? Cause I have no idea where it is. We're in the middle of the forest. Please help me and can you guide me there? So the birds do, the two birds fly with him and they lead him straight to the golden bough, the golden branch. Now when Aeneas goes up to it, he actually goes to tug on the tree and we hear from Virgil, which I think is so interesting. And so many people do harp on this as well, how interesting it is. Then Aeneas holds onto it and it resists him initially. 
and he instead just pulls it towards him to yank it off of the branch and then he he then walks back to where they are burying my sentence and all of this but it's that resistance that is so interesting that he has this little resistance and yet he just tugs at it anyways because he goes nope mine so very long story short then Aeneas goes back they then bury my sentence we get this whole description of how my sentence now there's like some mountain there when Virgil was writing and that is why there's some mountain there is because everything built on top of this guy's tomb and it's still called something to it I think it's literally called like Mount Mycenaeus so we get that whole description in the book after the burial of Mycenaeus Aeneas can now go into the underworld because the Sybil had said that if he were to do all these things then he could go in because the entrance of the underworld would then show itself to him so he goes back to the cave and there are lots of sacrifices that are then taking place at this moment lots of different sacrifices to different underworld deities take place in this cave both by the Sybil and by Aeneas himself he has his sword with him he's instructed to take his sword as well into the underworld by the Sybil because then the gates open right after they make all these sacrifices the gates open to the underworld and the Sybil acts as Aeneas's guide when they walk down and they follow the road into the ancient underworld. Now this is an incredibly exciting part of the story and again as I said I will not be going into every single part of the detail because we will just be here for too long so I'll just do the most important beats of the story. The first place that they end up that's of much importance is that they end up on the shores where Charon comes to pick up all of the souls in his ferry and then ferry them across the river to the main part of the underworld. So they end up on this beach and Aeneas doesn't really know what's going on. He sees all of these souls and they're sort of like trying to vie and trying to swim out to where Charon is because he's a little bit further than the port at this moment. So they're trying to swim out. He's sort of batting them all away and they can't get on the boat. And Aeneas turns to the Sybil and he asks her, you know, what's going on and, and why can't these souls get onto the boat and why are they stuck on this beach? And the Sybil explains that it's because they were not buried. They were not given the correct burial rights. So they don't have, when well, they don't have money to pay the ferry but also that their souls have not been laid to rest correctly and so therefore they are basically stuck in a limbo is the way that I describe it to people all the time. This is essentially uh, the ancient version of limbo where they're stuck there and they will not find their lasting resting place unless they are like given the correct burial rites. Now when they're on the beach Aeneas actually comes face to face with Palinurus from the previous book who had fallen overboard and Aeneas sees him in the crowd and he's like shook by this and he runs up to Palinurus and Palinurus runs up to him and they both have this moment of catching up where Aeneas is like where the f did you go what happened to you I didn't even see that happen I just woke up and you were gone tell me everything and Palinurus explains that actually when he fell off the boat he sort of woke up when he fell off the boat he felt this very strong force push him off the boat and then he's in the water and he swam for a very very long time but very long story short his body is now sort of tumbling throughout the waves right near an island um, so he asks Aeneas in this moment, it's pretty sad, he begs Aeneas and he says, no one is there to find my body, no one is there to bury me. You guys haven't done anything in order to really help my soul pass over so I can't get on the boat, but since you're here and you're alive, and so is the Sybil, can you guys bring me on the boat with you? Like, can I come with you, please? And Aeneas feels really bad in this moment, but the Sybil basically snaps at him and is like, excuse me, do you not understand how the underworld works? We absolutely cannot do that. That is not going to happen. We are not going to disobey the rules of the underworld just because Aeneas knows you. However, she does tell him that what they're gonna do instead is, I'm going to make sure that the gods contact, contact all of the people who live on the island where your body is, and they will be infused with the desire to bury you. So at some point, in the future, you will get on the boat, but today is not that day, son. Palinurus has a little sad face moment, and then Aeneas and the Sybil move forward towards the edge of the beach that Charon can now see them. And Charon notices, of course, that they're alive, and so he yells over to them and is like, uh, hello, what are you doing down here? You're not dead. He makes it very explicitly clear that he has done this far too much for people who are alive coming into the underworld, and it never goes well. In fact, he uses the example of like Theseus, Pirithus, Heracles, Hercules, sorry because we're in Rome, oh my goodness. But you know, he used the example of all of these heroes who have come down and who have either taken something or tried to take something, aka they tried to steal Proserpina, again I was gonna say the Greek name, but they tried to take Proserpina at one point, Pirithus tried to take Proserpina, so there was that whole thing, and then you know, Heracles, Hercules, holy crap, Hercules came down and he took uh, Cerberus up to the world of the living, so you know, obviously Charon has like, learnt his lesson and doesn't enjoy doing this, and he says that to them where he's just like, I keep putting people in danger because I bring people like you 
through this place. So why in the world do you think I would do anything differently this time? That's when the Sybil kicks up and the Sybil just goes, hello, hi, <laughs> let me introduce myself. I'm the Sybil, hi, nice to meet you. I am actually, you know, working for Apollo and this, this right here, really nice man, okay? His name is Aeneas, Aeneas, you know, show him the golden bow as well. And he has the key to the underworld. Does that not sway you? He just wants to talk to his dad. Can we just not like get in the boat? Honestly, we're not here to danger Proserpina. Your queen is safe and we have no intention to harm Cerberus whatsoever. Can we just get in the boat? We have the key. And Aeneas is obviously standing next to her, like holding the key, being like, I have it! And trying to hide his sword at the same time because like that's a little bit aggressive and he does have it by his side. And Charon is looking at the sword. So Aeneas is like, that's nothing, I swear. And Charon is surprisingly swayed by this. He's actually swayed mainly by the golden branch that he's holding. And so they're allowed to board uh, the boat and Charon brings them to the other side of the river. So now the pair are in the main part of the underworld. And the first thing that they notice is Cerberus, who is now like snapping his jaws and he's getting kind of mad because he guards the underworld. And when they get there, the Sybil does this absolutely fucking hysterical thing where she's packed a cake. I kid you the fuck not. She's packed a cake that she has baked with all of these like sleepy drugs in it, with all of these drowsy drugs. And so she throws the cake then at Cerberus and all its heads come and they try and eat a bit of the cake. And then immediately pass the f out. So the Sybil has drugged Cerberus in order for them to have an easy passage into the underworld. It's just a very odd little moment where she's like, no, I swear that like no harm's gonna come to Cerberus, but I will drug him. Okay, Sybil, do your thing. Anywho, they get off the boat, they walk through a bunch of different fields, which have different kinds of people in them, but the most important fields that they come to, again, that's a big chunk that you should go back and read because it's a very long chunk. But the main thing is that they go to the fields, uh, which are called the Morning Plains. And when they're walking through, Aeneas sees a familiar face and he sees Dido. Now bear in mind, as Aeneas, the character, he doesn't know that Dido's dead for sure until this moment when he sees her. And so it hits him and it hits him really hard. Aeneas immediately starts crying and he calls out for Dido. And he says to her, was this my fault? I didn't know that you died until right now. Like this is what my men have speculated. I didn't realize there was any truth to it. Was I the reason, was me leaving the reason why you felt this much pain that you had to come down here? Was this the only way of relieving your pain? I would have never dreamed that me leaving had caused you this much anguish and made you this distressed and I'm so sorry, but it wasn't of my own will, it was the gods. It was, I had to do this, you know, I had a destiny and it wasn't anything about you and I'm so, so sorry. And Dido has come up to stand in front of him, but she's not looking at him, which I think is so interesting that their whole book in book four, they're never looking at each other at the same time. And when Aeneas is talking to her, she still has her eyes downcast in the morning plains. And Aeneas is, Falling, and he wants her to come towards her, he wants her to come closer, but instead what she does, she turns around, her shade turns around and she runs into, uh, more so into the morning plains. And when Aeneas looks up to see where she's running to, she's running into the arms of Cyceus, her first husband. And as a collective, as an audience, all of us are like, oh my God. It is heartbreaking, it's such a heartbreaking moment. Um, but Aeneas obviously can't stay in the morning plane, so he has to continue on. And he has to leave Dido in her final resting place. So they continue walking and they end up in this field where all of these heroes are basically from the Trojan War. And the most important one that comes forward to him, uh, the one that we really need to recognize, is one of Priam's sons. And Priam's son, he goes under this name, I actually don't know how to, how to say it, Dei? Phobus? Diphobus? I'm not really sure. Somebody tell me in the comments below, but either way, he comes forward and he looks at Aeneas and he, let me tell you guys, he looks rough. Even Aeneas is like, holy shit, what happened to you? His soul in the underworld, his shade in the underworld, you guys, has no nose, has no ears. He's in shreds. Like he is barely the form of a person as a shade. And so he has a lot of explaining to do. And he does, he updates Aeneas on exactly what happened. Cause Aeneas was saying that like, they couldn't even find his body in Troy. So they had to honor him just like sort of in spirit. Cause they didn't know where his body had gone. And so they had to honor him in spirit only. And he does explain what happens to him. It's a very long story about what happened and how he lost all of his various, you know, offices, I guess. And then Aeneas updates him on his life. And there's a moment where they would have continued talking like all day and all night to when Sybil has to, you know, get in between them and goes, Aeneas. We came down here to speak to your dad, not to this guy. We only have a certain amount of time down here. Let's make the snappy. So Aeneas says goodbye to his friends. He says goodbye to a bunch of the other um, Trojan heroes. And then he starts walking towards where Elysium will be. And that's where his dad is. But on the road, the road leads two ways. So it's either they're gonna go to Tartarus, which is one side of the road, and the other side of the road is Elysium. And when they stop at this sort of fork in the road, 
that Aeneas looks down to where Tartarus is and he doesn't really know what it is. So he asks the Sybil to explain, you know, he's like, well, what's down there? Who is down there? And the Sybil does. The Sybil runs through a lot of different punishments that happen in Tartarus. We're not going to go through every single one of them, but they are very famous punishments that she points out. And it's this really dark, obviously it has to be this really dark description of what happens down in Tartarus, which is like the pits of hell for the worst of the worst. So she runs through all of that and then she basically ends it by saying, but there's no point in focusing on that because we're going to go this way anyways, because that's where Anchises is. What you have to do is take this little golden bow, your little key, put it on the ground, sprinkle yourself with water, I'll sprinkle myself with water, and then we'll be allowed in to the gates of Elysium. And that's exactly what they do. They do exactly that, and then they walk into the gates and it's like bright and sunny. There are meadows, there are fields, everybody's happy. There are all of these souls who are gathered around, but Aeneas cannot see his dad anywhere. And so he walks up to a soul and he says, you know, where is Anchises, where is he? And this guy says to him that nobody really has like a final resting place, like final spot, a final home, that they're just allowed anywhere in these fields, anywhere in these meadows. And so he ha he's basically gonna have to walk around and look for him, is the very, very good instructions that this random soul gives Aeneas. And Aeneas is like, uh, okay, that wasn't helpful. So Sybil's like, don't worry, boo, I got you. I see a little bit of a lookout point. I'm gonna go and walk up there. So she does and she spots Anchises below. So she's like, Aeneas, don't worry, found him. And so they go down to see Anchises. When they get down to Anchises, and Kaisa and his son have like this really cute moment where, you know, like they try to hug, but Aeneas obviously can't hug a shade, but there's like a lot of love there anyways. And they're saying you know, how much they miss each other. Um, he wants an update on like how life has been in the afterlife and in the underworld and all of this and uh, what he's been up to. And Anchises obviously wants an update on everything that's happened with Aeneas. But then what Aeneas asks, the, main, the first really important question that Aeneas asks him is where are we? And what is that river? And who are those people? by that river. To which then Anchises replies, and Anchises tells him that the river is Lethe. So Lethe is the river in the underworld, which is the river of forgetfulness. And he explains that the people who are lining up to drink from the river are doing just that, that they're trying to drink from the river because their bodies, some bodies, even in death, are so polluted that they can't get over all of the harm that was done to them. And so they have to go and drink from this river and they are gonna keep doing that, keep doing that, keep doing that and keep being basically reborn and dying to drink from this river so that their bodies, at some point their souls, will be unpolluted um, from what's happened in life. It's a very deep conversation that they have. It's much, much, much more in depth than what I just said, but that's the basic outline of what Anchises and Aeneas are talking about. But Anchises says, look son, that's a really nice conversation, but I needed you down here to tell you some very important show you some very important people, so follow me, follow me into this crowd, let me show you. And Anchises leads Aeneas and leads the Sybil into this crowd of people that are literally every single famous Roman you know. Like, I'm not even joking, it's not like really niche people, it's like Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, like, he sees everyone that you could possibly know from the kings through to the Roman Republic, through to the empire. And he lists them and he points at them and he goes, this is the family that that person is from. Here is Cato, who's another very famous Roman. Here's his family and he's gonna do this and that person's gonna do this and blah, blah, blah. Like he goes through every single one of them. You could have a history of Rome just from reading this one speech from Anchises. It is incredibly in depth. To the point where yet again, I brought my original notes to show you guys how long the speech is that Anchises says. And it goes from here, this is the original notes that I took again. So when I first make my notes of the book and I don't summarize, summarize, summarize in order to bring them here. Yeah, so it goes from here. These are all just names, by the way. And then it goes on the other side of the page up to here. These are all, it's literally just a list of names, one after the other, after the other. It's like Procus, Capis, Numita. Here are all of these very important people that you are starting, Aeneas. So you, you better get your shit together and you better want to go to Latium and you better want to fight that war and you better win. So go. Which is the whole point of this book that he's trying to really, really inspire Aeneas to even though he forgets why he's doing it maybe for himself, maybe why he's doing it for his son, he has to remember the future generations. And so he sees the future generations and he meets the future generations. And then after he's done that, and after Anchises is very happy with the idea that now Aeneas is reinvigorated, he's now re-motivated to continue on his journey to be this great hero. He then leads Aeneas and the Sybil back to the gates where they will uh, exit from the underworld. Now, this is very famous from the Odyssey that Penelope talks about these two gates, um, about dreams, and that is where Anchises drops off Aeneas and the Sibyl. So there are two gates in mythology. 
One is made of horn, which means that this is the gate where like easy dreams pass through, that like these are the truthful dreams, these are the ones that mean something, these are the nice dreams. They go through one gate. And then the other gate of ivory is where false dreams come. Penelope spoke about this in the Odyssey where she spoke about how she didn't know if her dreams of Odysseus coming home uh, were going to be through one gate or the other. She didn't know to believe them or to not believe them basically. And so the fact that Virgil took this on and he had his two characters go into the underworld and come face to face with both of these gates and most importantly, he has them walk through the gates of ivory as opposed to the gates of horn. So they walk through the gates of ivory to then leave the underworld. The book ends with Aeneas then walking to his comrades. He walks back to his men who are on the beach. He has them all pack up their camps, pack up the boats, and then they start sailing down to where Latium is. And that is the end of the book. Woohoo! The end of book six! We are now halfway through the Aeneid. You guys have just passed the halfway point of the Aeneid. So now we have just the latter part of the book, which is going to be leading up to the war in Latium and leading up to Aeneas now becoming king of the Latins and fulfilling that destiny in order to start everything and put everything into motion. So things start gearing up now. We've got a lot more drama. It's less of Aeneas crying. I, I mean, on average, he cries a little bit still because he's very emotional, but it's still a very exciting end and we're coming up to the end of it. And um, yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. I'm super excited to bring you guys book seven next time. Thank you guys so much for watching book six. I hope this helped slightly. Um, but yeah, we'll see you guys next time with more videos here on Morning. I'll see you then.